I want to introduce our our contestants today, um, who bring a wide range of experience and knowledge uh, to the uh, to the group, uh, and not just because some of them have uh, you know a few years on them. Um, never mind. I'm not going to I'm not going to get down that road because I'm on that road myself. Uh, Sarah Gallen is with us again. She's my colleague and cohort on this um, on the Uncle Bill seminar program, uh, but she has her own thoughts about. I, I hope she has her own thoughts about uh, looking for a job, and she'll chime in when uh, when when needed. Jared Fortney is works for Tate. You're the um, mechanical integrator right did i get that right uh yep that's me and if anyone knows what that means please let me know in the chat okay <laughs> yeah so he's a mechanical integrator for tate uh working right now in beijing uh, on a project for universal studios we're allowed to know that right well you do now well we do now <laughs> <laughs> um so it's 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 pathetically early for him, so be nice to him, okay? Uh, and next to him is Eddie Raymond, local 16. He retired vice president of uh, well, for, in charge of training for a number of years, put together their training program, which is the envy of the rest of the country. He was also uh, president of ESTA for a few years, which was, was not the envy of the rest of the country. <laughs> uh, and he and I and a couple of others uh, just put together the uh, New World Rigging Symposium, which apparently went well. Ann Valentino, um, recently retired from ETC. Um, oh, just tell us your title, what your title was again, Ann. I'm sorry. It was um, Senior Controls product manager. I was, I was basically the EOS product manager, which for anyone who's in lighting, that's a control console. Right. Kate Raymond. Uh, Kate is also at a local 16 and um, has been doing a fair amount of touring, just came off a tour, you know, as everybody did pandemic wise. Um, uh, you were the head electrician on that tour. Uh, no, I was I was the front light operator on Aladdin. Um, ah, I was okay. the head on American in Paris in China and Taiwan. Right, right. Okay. Previous uh, to that, barely. <laughs> and I uh, and and I'm your host, and um, away we go. Uh, what I liked, I'd like to ask Eddie to you know, this conversation is about looking for work, um, and I, I'd like to have Eddie talk to us first about uh, stuff from your, you know, area of expertise, your uh, sphere of influence, as it were. My sphere of influence. That's, an, that's a good one. Um, so I, I was going to talk about the uh, nuances and hiccups of getting a job with the IA in, in the United States and Canada. Um, the IA enjoys or suffers from, depending on your point of view, um, the thing called the home rule, which means that each local is in charge of how they bring members in, how they how they manage their own workforce, as long as it's within the confines of the rules of the international, which leaves them a lot of uh, leeway to make those sorts of choices. Um, <laughs> the uh, I think the thing that's uh, consistent about all of them is that the work fluctuates. And when it's really busy, any local in the country is looking for new people to come into it. Um, obviously, right now, isn't, that isn't the case. But I think coming back to work in the fall, and I, I have talked to a number of locals around the country, and what seems to be consistent is that they're very fearful that they're going to lose a, a large core of their the workforce they had before the pandemic. And to that end, they're going to be looking to bring new people in. Most of the locals re will take your resume um, and put you on a list of people to call when they get busy. Um, 
if you happen to be in Atlanta or in Hollywood right now, there is work hey, to Eddie? be had. Yeah. We just lost your audio. You lost my audio? No. Is it no. We can hear him fine. No. Oh, I just lost it. Sorry. <laughs> Never mind. You lost it again? No, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Hollywood and Atlanta in particular are booming right now. There, there's a lot of stuff happening in motion picture and television, and they are looking for bodies, qualified bodies. Um, generally speaking, uh, you sh if you're interested in working for an IA local, you should contact that local and, and just ask them what their policy is on applying for, for new workers. And that's going to vary a lot. Um, like I said, most of them will accept resumes and they'll keep those resumes on file for when they get busy. Uh, the resumes are really and truly important for your getting looked at for a potential worker. Um, I, I used to review all the resumes that we got at Local 16 and that was probably five or 600 a year. Um, and because we got so many and because there are so few positions open, if I didn't get a resume that answered the questions I needed answered, I, I really didn't consider the person unless there was something intriguing about them. But generally speaking, you know, uh, and you should all probably know this already, so forgive me if I'm, you know, being repetitive, but um, your contact information, you know, don't just give me your email, give me your cell phone number, you know, and give me an address where I can mail things to you. Those are really important nowadays. Um, email address, your snail mail address, and your phone number. You'd be amazed how many resumes we get that don't have that. Um, give me your real name, not your nickname. Uh, when we're doing background checks on things, uh, that's important to know that. Uh, if I do a background check and your name doesn't show up, I'm probably not going to hire you uh, or put you to work. Um, the, the other key things on your resume, I want to know what your actual skills are. You know, it doesn't tell me much if you tell me, well, I was an electrician on, you know, Gone with the Wind. Okay, was that a high school production, a college production? Was that a professional production? Was it on tour? Was it on Broadway? Where, where was the show? So tell me what your skills are. What are the things that you are well versed in? And then tell me where you have applied those so I can put them in context. And then the final thing is re uh, references. You know, give me references and make sure you've checked with your references before you put them on your resume. So when I call them, they're not calling, <laughs> they're not saying who, or I'd never hire that person in, in a million years. Um, check with your resumes before, or your references before you put them on your resume and make sure that they're ready to go. Um, Cause we will call them. We'll call two or three references on each resume when we get ready to add people into our system. And I think the other thing to know coming in to the IA, if you're coming out of college in particular, um, you may have incredible skills. You know, you may be the best board operator that God ever put on the face of the earth. We're not going to send you out as a board operator on your first job. It's too much responsibility. The show is much more important than any one individual. So we're going to put a known quantity into those positions. Your first job and almost every local is going to be unloading trucks, pushing boxes, following instructions, showing up on time and being there when you're needed. If you can do those basic things, then you'll probably get a second call. But if you can't show up on time, if you're if pushing if you're above pushing boxes and loading and unloading trucks and you can't follow instructions, we really don't have much of a need for you. So I'm always looking for the person who's standing there going, what's next? Who's got the tools that they need to do their job, who shows up on time, and who has an attitude that is contagious to everybody else's good work, as opposed to someone who prevents other people from doing their work. Um, so if you want to get a job through one of the IA locals, first thing is call the local, see what their policies are. Make sure you have a rock solid resume to share with them. And then be, be the person who you know they can rely on when you get your first chance. And I think that's pretty much it. Like I said, it's going to vary from local to local around the country. Um, thanks, Eddie. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the West Coast. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I think you said New York also. Atlanta. Uh, mov movies and film. Um, yeah. Uh, Gordon has has mentioned that uh, Toronto is also booming. Are they? I think that that's. Okay. What I, th I think uh, Vancouver's booming too. Right, right. From what um, I've heard, most of our stage local is currently working in the film industry. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty much the only work we have in Local 16 right now. Is a couple of TV series that we're shooting, and I think there's a feature coming in. So. Um, we had been talking. Um, off screen, I guess, uh, with uh, a couple of the uh, local 80 folks. And, um, you know, they were t talking about how incredibly busy they are and that they're looking for a lot of people. And one of the things that came up in that conversation, if, and I don't mean, well, I do mean to throw you under the bus, Eddie. Um, I've been there before. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you want to see the tracks? <laughs> But um, one of the things that um, that was mentioned was that, um, and I think you said it was easier to get into a local, I think you said it, it's easier to get into a local in Santa Fe than it is to get into a local in 80. Um, so the, I, guess the question, I guess the question is- Depending on how busy they are, but go ahead. No, I guess the, the question is, is that, a, is that a path? Is that a pathway to, uh, success, you know, to get for getting a job. Yeah. Um, you know, being where the work is, is really important. Um, and the thing about local 80 right now is that, uh, they have a lot of members and about three weeks ago, I know that they, they were what they call working off the books, which means that everybody who wanted a job had a job and they're looking for members who aren't working at the time to go take jobs, at which point there are openings uh, to bring in new new people, new blood to fill those positions. Um, I know that uh, locals, the outside of Los Angeles, um, we have studio mechanics locals, which are not strictly craft based in Hollywood, all the, each locals is, is its own craft. So local 80 is a craft just for grips, local 728 is just for lighting technicians. Uh, but in places like New Mexico um, and Atlanta and New York, I believe in Toronto and Vancouver as well, there's studio mechanics local. So everyone who works in that industry belongs to the same local. What, what's the, when, what is the deal in Toronto, Greg, Gordon? Uh, all crafts are 873 except for camera, I believe. Right, right. 600 for camera up there too? I, I don't know off the top of my head. I thought, I thought it was 667, but. Well, you're right. It's 667 in Canada. But all around the country, that's going to be true. Camera's going to be its own local, even in the studio mechanics locals. But uh, all the other crafts in the studio mechanics locals are one local. So there's more opportunities within the studio mechanics locals than they're going to be on any one local in Hollywood. And they're very, very busy. Um, there's a lot of, there's, with all the streaming networks right now, there's a lot of demand for product. So they're trying to fill that demand. And they're, you know, I know Atlanta is just slamming. I have one friend from 16 who's working in Atlanta, who's working on one TV show and three fil feature films doing special effects because they just don't have enough bodies to have a dedicated crew for one film. Right. So, so the work's out there, you're just gonna go looking for it. Yeah. Um, Jared, I'm going to bring you up next, but before we do, I'm going to tag one more thing onto the back end of Eddie's conversation. Uh, and that was some conversations that we've been having with, um, the, some Broadway people and what there's some really gen, what I believe to be genuine concern. And you kind of, um, uh, intimated this early on Eddie, that, um, when tours start back up again, hopefully by the fall, in the fall, um, the Broadway tours, uh, and, and the, you know, the, 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 nationals and the rest of, you know, the rest of the levels of tours that go out, um, they're going to be hurting when they get to, um, secondary and tertiary markets, because those markets are not going to be able to fill the, uh, fill the calls. They just don't have the people anymore. A lot of people have left the industry over the past year because they needed a job and 
you know, they went out and they took a job in another in another industry and discovered that they like being home at dinner time. Um, <laughs> you know, and and they're not coming back. Um, so one of the things to consider uh, is looking at either where you are now or where maybe you would like to be and see what kind of a market is there um, for, you know, for the, for the, what we believe hopefully will be the near future, not necessarily, you know, tomorrow, but uh, over the summer into the early fall. Uh, Jared, you want to tell us a little bit about what you're up to and, you know, what the opportunities are? Hi. Yeah. Uh, Hi, good to see everyone. Uh, a bit of a perfect segue uh, in terms of following the work. Uh, that's how I find myself here in Beijing. Uh, I think actually the Times, New York Times, has been doing a fair amount of reporting on uh, a bit, as Eddie's saying, the film and television work, uh, and even uh, seems some Broadway work, or at least in Broadway style work, is navigating uh, east a bit, Australia, New Zealand. A little bit mainland China. Um, and so a big advantage is being able to, to chase that work internationally even. Uh, so fortunately with a sort of global company like Tate, uh, I've had the ability to come over here. We've got a fairly, fairly strong team over here, um, including a fair number of uh, people in our Hong Kong and mainland China offices or uh, work areas. Uh, I think it's going to be a really interesting summer. I think you're you're not wrong, Bill. As as things start to pick back up and we figure out who who went where and how keen they are to come back to entertainment, uh, it's going to be a lot of opportunity. Uh, I think is going to be the best way to look at it. Is that it's a opportunity across the industry to sort of resort. Uh, lots of people moving, lots of different places, and lots of openings coming. Uh, I don't I don't. Uh, We'll see how it shakes out sort of on the production and the, and the touring side. Uh, hard to know because so many of those people are contract to contract, uh, certainly in the world that I live in, sort of rock and roll touring and music touring, especially uh, where those people have ended up, as you say, whether they're excited to come back uh, and some new opportunities for, for new people and, and, and you know, skills that, that haven't been exercised in, in quite a while. So I think uh, I think that's going to be something that we're going to see is is yeah I, I imagine for many of the companies that produce stuff development is continued um, you know produce control systems or 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 uh, hardware for the entertainment industry develops developments continued so there's going to be new versions of of uh, software uh, you know Tate's Tate's uh, put out the the newest uh, version of um, our control software IQ in the last. Uh, 18 months. I don't remember exactly when it was launched officially, but uh, quite a few revisions in the last 18 months. There's a little bit of new training material out there, but as that starts to roll out in the industry, I mean, uh, there'll be more and more demand for for training and access to materials and and skilled operators who who haven't uh, haven't worked, you know, for for quite a while. Uh, so I think there's going to be a lot of a lot of push to train people in a hurry and a lot of push to 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 polish and repolish skills in a hurry a lot of opportunities hopefully to uh to give people some new skill uh i don't know did anyone see the um nam what, what did they call it uh, believe in music something like this their online uh their online session seminar conference thing um I, there was a really interesting uh session in there something like leadership leadership in production it was um Jim Digby, especially, and a few other people uh, who were who were giving different perspectives on the on what's coming in the industry. And I thought uh, Jim had an interesting uh, warning. Maybe warning is too strong a word, but uh, like, let's let's all remind ourselves that we're coming back to this a bit rusty, and we need um, we need opportunities to to get our training wheels again, get ourselves back up to speed. So so I think that's going to hopefully yield uh, some new opportunities for. Uh, for people to find their find their new place in the industry, uh, I know I certainly don't speak on behalf of Tate, but um, but uh, you know there's there we're all hoping uh, across the industry for for a quick uh, rebound or or a quick acceleration to uh, these public events. You know, uh, it's been a long time since we've had 
the ability to have social events, uh, whether they're whether they're corporate based or or uh, entertainment based. Uh, so I think it's going to be exciting as that picks up speed. I think a lot of companies are going to start to look for uh, look for their staff too, because uh, their freelancers are are off in the world, um, and and have to have to find their place, find their way back to to their uh, normal uh, the normal flow of of scheduling and production and all these things. I think, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that uh, leads to, right. unfortunately, it's not quite as, as uh, laid out as, uh, as coming to the IA. Um, you, uh, we can speak a little bit about, about coming into, you know, uh, sort of the design build, um, world the integration world where i live if that's um if that's something you want to look at well I'm, i think we all would like to look at all of it um i mean my first my first curiosity was that you know working for tate i mean do i have to move to Lidditz? <laughs> there's nothing wrong with Lidditz, pennsylvania it's oh, lovely. No, no there's you're absolutely right there's nothing wrong but if we all move to Lidditz, then there will be something wrong with Lidditz. Well, yeah, the housing crisis. Let me tell you. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I. There's. I, th I think we've all. I think we all appreciate in the production world that having all of the disciplines and all of the creative energy from from everyone who contributes to a production in one place. Uh, you know, it's going to be very. Uh, I, I suppose we've all found our ways to produce over Zoom recently. But I don't think going forward that there's going to be a lot of, uh, uh, you know, teching shows by a Zoom. And there's something that happens when everyone's in the same place. And I think that's uh, that's also true of a place like Tate, um, where the the special sauce or the or the the spark comes from having people in in the same place and the opportunity to share and cross pollinate ideas and run over and you know tap somebody on the shoulder, remember an idea that we worked with, uh, you know, many years ago, let's steal that little bit from this, for this project and that thing. And, oh, you know, check in with somebody else. They, uh, they always have the right answer on, on whatever the problem is or system is. Uh, so I, I <laughs> to, to your question, yeah, uh, more than likely, certainly, certainly come to one of the offices. We've got, uh, main production facility in Lidditz. Uh, we certainly have a few offices in the UK for anyone who is sort of UK based, um, different facilities over there. And, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of creative energy that happens in those facilities. So I think uh, it's, it's worth being in those facilities, worthwhile being in those facilities and, and living in that environment. If, uh, if a place like Tate is, is something that you're interested in. If, if they are interested, you know, and you, you do, you know, show up on, on a doorstep somewhere in the world. Who are you looking for? Are you looking for HR or are you looking for uh, creative? I mean, is there a, a, a more beneficial route to take, if you will? Uh, you mean just in terms of, 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 of finding a path in? Yeah. Um, to be, to be honest, uh, it's, uh, you know, we, we don't try to hide when we, when we're looking for help. So, so the, the website, LinkedIn is a place to go. Um, we've got a full-time HR team. Uh, and I, and I think very soon we're going to have a full-time uh, recruitment team as well. And, uh, and, and when there's jobs to be had, they'll be out there looking for them, um, looking to fill them as fast as they can. So, uh, you know, like I'm sure, like everybody, everybody else, tatetowers.com slash careers will get you to the the most up-to-date listings, uh, LinkedIn as well should have them. And, um, and yeah, it's, uh, you know, I think, I think our, the industry, the industry works, the industry within Tate works the same as it does outside, right? Knowing, knowing people, uh, getting, getting a direct referral, uh, accounts a lot and certainly counts on, on yeah, sure. speeding up that process. Um, so there's definitely there, but, but we don't, you know, it's, it's all, it's all out there posted as, as quick as, uh, as quick as we can to uh, try to fill those positions. And speaking, and there's some up there. There's, there's a good handful up there. 
Yeah. Bill, I think one of the things that Tate has that if you're interested in that kind of work is their training program for their uh, motion control stuff that's just phenomenal um, and affordable. And uh, it would also introduce you to people who work at Tate. Uh, so you, yeah. it'd be a win-win situation for you if you were interested in going that direction in the design build, especially with the motion control things to get in there and take some of their trainings and then uh, kind of see what the vibe is like at Tate. When I walked through the training facility, it was really exciting, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Jared gave us a tour and we were, we were <laughs> much blown away by what, what they were doing. So yeah, it, I highly recommend it if that's the direction you want to go. Is, is Geronimo still doing the training over there? He is certainly still there. Um, trainings, uh, as, as everyone might imagine, are, are still on hold. Uh, certainly as far as I know, due to COVID, but I'm sure the minute we can start to get them back up and running, we, uh, we certainly will. Good. Yeah. I was going to just point out, you know, Geronimo is worth the price of admission. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed. Uh, thanks, Jared. Thank you much. Appreciate it. Uh, folks, I do want to sure. remind you that um, you get to ask questions too. Um, it's a small group. So if you've got a question, just kick it out there and, uh, and I'm sure one of us will figure out a way to answer it. Uh, Kate, do you want to come up next? Uh, sure. Hi, I'm Kate. Uh, I've been touring for a while now. It seems to have taken over my life. Um, it's great. Uh, broad, I do mostly do Broadway touring, not rock and roll touring, which are two very separate worlds. They overlap, of course, but the skill sets and the negotiations and hours and they're similar but very different um as far as broadway touring goes there's different tiers of tours there's different contracts different things you can look out for um definitely when you're starting as eddie was saying about starting in the local i would you know for myself it's easier to start as an assistant even if you may have the skills to be ahead just to get uh under your belt the idea of how it all flows, how it moving to different places every week or every other week or every month um, affects the way that you do your job, where you go, the different circuits that you play. So different tiers of contracts go to different places typically. Um, and that directly reflects the kind of labor that you get. Not always, you can go to a total C circuit place and get A people in your crew, but that's not the norm. Um, hard load-ins, load-outs, places. Uh, I, when I was training on Bright Star, we were in Salt Lake City, which is great, but we were there at the secondary um, venue and it was a college and half of the people showed up. So I did my first load-out with half of the people, but it went great because I was learning. Uh, so we had double people on the prop team because I was there. So they had an extra person and you know, you just have to learn how to flow um, with what you get, because you never know what it's going to be. You could be in Chicago and have a terrible crew, which is very rare. Stage hands in Chicago are great, yeah. but you know, whatever is going to happen is going to happen. And learning how to take your technical knowledge from school or other experience that you have and translate that into practical knowledge uh, under high pressure, under sleep deprivation. Um, I would show up places and people would be like, why is everything labeled so many ways? Like, why are there so many colors? And I'm like, well, none of us have slept in 72 hours. So, you know, red to red is easier than explaining that this one goes there. Like numbers and letters become confusing when you haven't slept in a long time. Um, and it's more of a universal language unless you get somebody who's colorblind. Uh, but yeah, practical knowledge and learning from people around you. I've had the opportunity and blessing to work with a lot of older generation stagehands who have taught me great things, life lessons, work lessons, little workarounds you can do to trouble, how to troubleshoot. There's lots of different ways to troubleshoot things and people who have been doing it for 40 years have more experience and they've seen all of the different ways and they've made choices about how they do it and being on tour with those people, you can ask them those things, you know, when you're drinking after the show, not at the time. Um, what else can I say? Uh, <laughs> touring is a lot. 
it can be very all-consuming, but it can also be very family-like, very loving. Uh, you're with these people everywhere you go. You have to rely on each other, even if you don't like each other, which is also a good life lesson to learn. Um, yeah, it's been catastrophic as it has across the industry. Um, most of my friends that tour don't really know what to do with themselves. The way that many stagehands that I know in Local 16 kind of don't know what to do with yourself. You, you've made sacrifices to do this and be good at it. And now it's taken away. It feels like, not like somebody actually took it. But, um, figuring out if you still wanna do this, if you still wanna be a stagehand, if you still wanna tour and never see your family or your loved ones, or if you wanna bring them with you when you tour, people's lives have been shaken up a lot. Um, it'll be interesting to see who comes back when we start, when production people start making phone calls, when Broadway starts going. I feel like Broadway will definitely be the beginning and then tours will start to like trickle down, but that might not be true. There might be, I know some lower tier non-union tours are talking about doing things. Um, they have different qualifications for going back out there. Um, everyone will be available for the first time ever. Like the people that do choose to say, everyone will be available, which is, doesn't happen ever, you know? You'll get phone calls while you're out on tour and they'll be like, oh, could you do this thing? And you're like, well, actually I'm on this thing, but I could do it this day. And all of that negotiation, doing interviews on phone chats, cause you're about to like start a show. That won't be there. People, and people will have a better idea, I think about what they want to do. So I'm really curious to see how it all plays out. Um, as far as getting work through touring, uh, that is very dependent on which department you wanna work in. Uh, I work mostly as an electrician. I've also done props uh, and I've gotten my jobs in varieties of ways. For electricians, it usually comes from the production electrician, production manager, or your head electrician. So the people above hire, create teams, um, depending on what companies you're working for. Some of them have lists of people that they like to use. I've gotten calls from production companies because somebody I used to work with as a production manager is like friends with somebody else and they called and said, hey, do you know somebody who can be a front light operator or a deck electrician or I need a moving light technician? And they'll call and kind of ask for references from people as opposed to going to resumes, they'll go to somebody they know and say, hey, who do you know that's good that's available right now? And then if I'm not available, they'll often ask me if I know somebody who's available. So a lot of it is word of mouth, but um, something I will say that my one of my old bosses told me is it's easy to get your first job it's really hard to get your second job. Um, getting hired and getting in the door, especially with the lower tiered contracts where you don't make as much money is pretty easy. A lot of the companies love to hire people right out of college because they see them as moldable and they have a lot of skills that they want and they're not going to argue with you about like things. I'm just gonna stop right there. <laughs> um, but getting the higher tiered contracts is harder and it takes experience and it takes time. Um, definitely take what you can get. You never know what tour that you think is crappy and below you is going to lead to later. Um, you never know when you're gonna go through somewhere and someone will recognize you uh, and that'll lead to something great. Um, so definitely, especially when you're starting out, take the jobs that are available, take the jobs that are there uh, and take what you can from them. It might not be the best experience, but you can always learn something from everyone, even people that you don't want to talk to <laughs> so that you will encounter sometimes on tour. Um, so try to take that knowledge and that patience. Uh, be really respectful of the people that you work with. Even if you're in a local where everyone seems terrible, uh, it's their home, it's their house and you're visiting. So try to be respectful of that, even if you don't agree with what they're doing. I put my my line down at my foot down at safety. If something's unsafe, I'm going to make you do it differently. But there's a lot of different ways to hang a light, to run a cable. Um, the details are less important as long as it gets done consistently and safely. So being flexible in that way, you might actually learn something. When hanging front of house moving lights, I love to take like whoever's the, uh, some locals have paid assistance in theaters, some of them don't, but whoever the head sends me and be like, how do you do it usually? Cause they know all the tricks. They know all the little rigging tricks, all the little, oh, there's an, 
there's an elevator in this theater, which is crazy, but it does exist. There are elevators in box booms in some places. Um, and use that knowledge. To, uh, everything you can delegate safely is something you don't have to do. And that is opens you up to do other stuff, which is great. Um, not sure how helpful that was. Uh, training, do lots of trainings. Uh, I was working on moving lights for years before I did the moving light, the VL training, but I still was able to learn great things. And now that's something I have on my resume, but also I have access to all of the VL uh, information. So if I'm working on a light I'm not familiar with, I can go in and actually look at the schematics and things of it because doing the training gave me access to that. Um, training, training, training. Be nice to people. Uh, just keep trying too. I circulated my resume for ye a long time before I actually got a job and it wasn't through circulating my resume, but that resume came back later and got me other jobs. So keep trying, listen to the people around you, especially if you're a local working with people on tour, listen to what they say, watch how they do things. Um, don't be afraid to make your own path of how you choose to interact with people and do stuff, but try to be respectful. Because even though you're in a different place every time, people talk. Head electricians across the country talk to each other. Head carpenters talk to each other. They know like when a show is coming and somebody, you know, like dropped a chain motor out of the sky or something like that gets around. People know. Uh oh, you just froze. There you go. What? Oh, it, it froze on my screen. That's I okay. I'm gonna stop talking. So, <laughs> um. Feel free to ask any questions. I, I, uh, I did want to. I did want to ask you. Um, you mentioned production companies. Uh, yes. Um, and I don't tour. I haven't toured since that oh, was before you were born. Uh, but uh, uh, do you have production companies uh, that you would, I guess, recommend or at least uh, can tell us who the, who who some of the production companies are that you'd be willing to like mention their names. Um, so there's different levels of production companies as far as I have experienced. Um, there are networks is a very like base. They do a lot of tours, not as many first nationals, which is a tour that is going out for the first time that tends to be a higher paid contract. Um, so there's different levels of tours and there's different levels of contracts. It's complicated. Basically you make more money on some of them and you have better rights and response rights there with the idea being that you have better responsibilities with that show. If you're doing a more complicated show, you get, should get paid more. That is not necessarily always true. Um, there are some great companies. Uh, I worked for Disney, which I was never really interested in doing. Uh, turned out to be wonderful. They took great care of us. I was working when the pandemic hit um, and they went above and beyond for the cast and the crew on that show. Uh, in the middle of the chaos. Our, I had really good company managers who overlook all of the paychecks, travel, housing, per diem, things like that. Um, and they had a lot to do with how well that was handled. Uh, small details in different companies can be huge. Uh, Juniper Street's a great company to work for. They don't have a lot of shows. They typically only put out a couple shows. Um, right now, I believe they still have Dear Evan Hansen. Um, and I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure who else they have out right now. They closed Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but I'm not sure what's going to come back when things come back. Um, there's also companies like Feld that do all of the ice tour shows. Um, I didn't start touring until I was older. I had worked at the opera for six years during that period where most people, kind of in their early 20s, go out and do that. I was working at the opera, um, but they, if you want to get your foot in the door the networks and Feld and Troika will usually hire company people like that, as opposed to some of the other uh, better paid, better showed companies uh, want more experience, but that's not necessarily always true. I was an advanced electrician for Aurora as my very first kind of sample tour job. Aurora is another really good company. Um, as far as like getting in touch with these people, it's complicated because there's production managers so there's a production company and there's production managers and all those production managers do have it like a show under that they are taking care of. So you can send your resume to the company, but it's better if you have an idea of who you want to send it to there. And that depends 
on what you're looking for, what job you're looking for. Um, also, if you want to do carpentry, you can get jobs reaching out to head carpenters that you know, as opposed to going through the production company. Um, networking is great. Also, just talking to people, doing trainings, like somebody mentioned, is wonderful. Um, I need more coffee. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> there's lots of variety out there. Um, and there's lots of different ways to get it. I Sometimes you have a show that comes through town when I was a local and you make friends with those people and then somebody leaves that show and they call and they're like, hey, are you available? Because you've already, uh, as Eddie was saying, you've established that you can be a positive influence on the people around you. If you show up and the people on your, you're making the road crew laugh and you guys are all getting stuff done quicker than they usually do, they remember. And they like that you can work with each other. They already know you fit into their circle of people that they've created. So when they're looking to replace somebody, they don't want to upset the matter too much. They reach out to you. Whether or not that pans out or something that you want to do is different, but it always feels nice to get a phone call from a head carp being like, hey, what are you doing? Remember that time that we came through? Want to come with us to Arizona? Uh, things like that. Does that answer your question? <laughs> No, that does. It's great. great. Uh, the moral of the story is don't piss off the road folks. Not necessarily. <laughs> They're not all great people and we all have bad days. Um, right. But try to listen to why they tell you to do it that way. Um, they've already done it a bunch of times. They've seen what doesn't work and what does work. And when they're telling you specifically to like do something that way, if they tell, tell you specifically, there's a reason. And they don't have time to explain you that reason because right. they have other things to do. If they say like, take this cable to that mark, they don't care how you do it. But if they say like, make sure that when you take this cable to that mark, that you look out for that cutout in the ground where the automation guy is working. And don't forget about the sound guys who's run their cable down the middle of the stage. You got to go under that, not over that. That's because somebody went over it and it caused chaos or dropped the cable into the automation and ruined a wench. You, you never know what's going to happen. You always have time to explain that. So try to listen, be attentive, stand there and, you know, like ask what's next without being demanding that somebody give you something to do right now. Don't demand their attention. Just be available. Cool. Being, being available and being jovial, friendly, being able to laugh when stuff doesn't go right because stuff won't always go right. You know, we always had like a feeder party when I was doing deck cable, which sucks because feeder's heavy, but if you make it, if you can make it fun and the people around you can do it together, it doesn't have to, it's not a pain, you know? It just seems overwhelming because it's heavy and long. Cool. Thank you. That was great. Thank you very much. Anybody else have any questions? We're going to move on to, to Anne. You're up next. Um, okay. Anne Valentino. Hey guys. So I have been involved in the manufacturing or supply side of the industry pretty much my entire career, um, which was a long time. Um, and I got into it at my very first job after getting out of grad school, which I was a technical director who opened, I opened a brand new performing arts venue outside of Houston. And, you know, this was before the internet and all that stuff. And I'd never been to a trade show. I didn't know the players in the industry. Um, and I, it was the worst consulted theater ever. And so I was 22 years old and this theater was absolutely non-functional and they had spent millions of dollars on it and it didn't work. And I got really interested in like, who does this to people? <laughs> like, Who are the people who make the buildings happen? Like, I, I don't even understand any of the people who are involved in how this happens, but we got screwed royally. And I'm interested in like making sure that people don't get screwed royally when they pay millions of dollars for a venue, it should be functional. So my first job was as a technical writer. Um, I actually, and this is where I think Sarah, or Kate has said this, Eddie has said it, Jared mentioned it as well. It's all about networking. I happened to meet Joel Rubin at a trade show who was at the time the leader, the, he managed the sales division for Klegel, which used to be a big important lighting company in the industry. And, um, we just had a brief chat about the thesis that I wrote when I was in grad school. And I wrote him a letter and just said, I'm really interested to know 
like, how does all of this work? Should I go back to school and get a degree in electrical engineering? But I'm really interested in the backside of how facilities come together. And based on the letter that I wrote, letter writing is an important skill. Punctuation matters, spelling matters. They flew me to New York and offered me a job as a tech writer because of the letter that I wrote. So pay attention to those things. In the manufacturing or supply side, because it's not just manufacturing, this is going to be true not just of lighting companies, but of audio companies or rigging companies, possibly. Bo could speak to that way better than me. Um, <clears throat> I worked for Very Light for a while, which was NPRG, so I've worked on the, the higher company side. Um, usually, when you think of manufacturing or supply, the supply side of the business, you think of sales positions, you know, and everyone's, ooh, sales. And there are certainly sales positions because we have to have those people, but they're also, and they're really important. There are also a lot of other jobs in the supply side of the industry that um, people might not think about um, as being places that their skills could be used. And one of the interesting things about that is that it, it like, let's say that your favorite thing in life is laying out systems. Like you love doing network risers figuring out where all the bits and bobbles go. And that is just your thing. And you get to do it every now and again, but it's not your primary job. Well, you know what? If you get a, com a job at a lighting manufacturer, you could become a systems engineer. And you could be the person who takes the bid documentation once the job has been closed, takes all the stuff that the consultants and the electrical engineers have put together, and you actually can make a functional system out of it. And, that, and, those, and the work that you've done there to design the system is what goes forward into manufacturing and that they actually build and ship to the job. And oh, by the way, if that's not part of your thing, but you love equipment, you love hands-on, you love fixing things, you could be a commissioner that actually brings the system up once it's installed, right? So the equipment gets shipped, it's installed by, a, let's just say it's lighting, it's installed by a local electrical contractor. They don't turn everything on because they don't understand enough about the equipment to verify that it's working. So the manufacturer involved will send out a systems commissioning person who brings the entire system up. They ring out all the wiring. They make sure that if you plug into this thing that's labeled this circuit, that's connected to that dimmer that actually comes on when you do that. Um, if you like troubleshooting, if you, know, you love the, the hunting down of what the problem is, you could be a technical support specialist, either on the phone or someone that gets sent out to a job site. If you like explaining things to people, you could become a tech writer. Um, you, if you enjoy the, you know, the designing process, the thought process that leads to products, you could become a product manager. And that does it, product managers in our industry don't normally come from engineering. We are normally people who come from entertainment. And we interface with R&D on the actual design of products, what they should do, how they function. Um, there are just a plethora of jobs that are available that keep your hand in the production world. Because for me, it was a big deal for me to think about leaving production because I had gone to school. I had planned my career was going to be in the production side of the business. And at 23, like I just bailed on all that stuff and I switched over to manufacturing without really understanding what the potential was. And it's certainly, you know, 40 years later, there are many more jobs now on that side of the business than there used to be. Um, so there are, there are a lot of opportunities. At ETC, we have projects, our jobs called field project coordinators, and basically you're, you're technical salespeople. So you interface between sales staff and customers. And so you're a direct line of contact for your market. Um, and, and usually, certainly from the ETC standpoint, if you're a practitioner in a given market, whether it's Broadway, whether it's Los Angeles, your point of contact into the company is usually gonna be the field project coordinator. And there are people that everybody knows. Nick Gonsman is one. Um, he's famous in Broadway because he's the guy that everyone calls when they have a question. Uh, he subsequently took my job, so he's not available to do that work anymore. But there are just there are tons of opportunities available that you might not think about that are really um, that service that sort of um, 
the part of you that led you to being in production to begin with, the, 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 that need that you had to be creative and to be part of this production family, those jobs do exist on the manufacturing side. And this is gonna be true of any, of any manufacturer, I think. Um, coming out of COVID lockdown, you know, Jared said something about the fact that R&D had continued and I can guarantee you for a fact that R&D had continued. And one of the crazy things about COVID world has been that for those of us who were involved in product development, <clears throat> so much of what was taking, you know, so much of our time was supporting productions. And in my job, you know, if there was a problem on a Broadway show, they would call and scream at me after the problem had been solved to let me know that the problem had existed. And, you know, part of my thing was then to work with the, you know, the development group for my products to make sure that whatever was encountered on that particular show doesn't happen again. Well, when production shuts down globally, you find that you have a lot more time on your hands for doing actual development work because you're not supporting productions anymore. And I think that coming out of COVID, a lot of companies are gonna be looking at what their structure is. They're using this as an opportunity to figure out, you know, this is an ideal time for companies to make structural changes in how they present in the marketplace and what their infrastructure in the company is like. And I, I think all smart companies are looking at that right now that maybe they're not gonna come back exactly the way they were. Maybe they're not gonna fill the same positions. Maybe they're gonna be filling different positions and maybe they're gonna be structuring the outflow from their product or from their manufacturing facility out into the market. They might be structuring that differently than they were before. So this is kind of an ideal time. If this is something that you think might be interesting to you to reach out to some of those companies and the one of the paths you know, this, everything in this industry, and everyone has alluded to it already, is about networking. It's about who you know. <clears throat> I have never once gotten a job because I sent a resume into HR, and HR called me and said, hey, we think you'd be great at this. Every single job I've ever gotten has been because I knew somebody, right? And so you, you, when you're getting started, and I think if any of you are just coming out of college, um, most manufacturers will run internship programs. Um, even, even higher companies do. PRG has a huge internship program. Uh, I don't know that they're doing it this summer because we don't really know what the production world is gonna look like. We don't know when people are gonna be back in the factory full time. Um, I, and certainly from ETC standpoint, a lot of people who have been interns with us, even if they've interned while they were in school, if they wanted a job with us when they were out of school, we almost always hired them because we knew them at that point. Um, so internships are a really great way. If you're not completely sure that this is the direction that you wanna go, give it a try, take an internship, see what happens. You'll learn a lot about the company and you could, we've, um, we had at ETC, we have internships pretty much in every department. Um, we always, on the EOS team, we always hired two interns to do product testing. So if you're, you know, if your groove is you like to run EOS all day long and look for everything that's possibly could be wrong with it and tell them, hey, I found a thing that's broken, we will pay you to do that for a summer. And then you could figure out, do I like this kind of stuff? Do I like this company? Do I see other opportunities at the company that I might like better? Um, and most manufacturers, um, always have an eye for talents and will find a place for a person that they think has a spark, right? So um, if that sounds interesting, the, you know, in, kind of in a crazy place right now, because normally I would say, well, you know, go to LDI and hang out in the booth and meet some people. And I think they're going to do LDI this year. Uh, you should send a resume in, even if you don't know particularly what job you're interested in, go ahead and send a resume. Uh, Jared mentioned LinkedIn, because I'm retired, I disconnected, you know, disabled my LinkedIn account, but um, they will check. And if you don't have a profile on LinkedIn, most companies don't consider you a real human. So make sure you have something on LinkedIn because they will check it. Um, Facebook is not good enough. You have to, <laughs> it has to be on LinkedIn. 
send your resume in, keep an eye out. Almost all manufacturers will have a career, like Jared said about Tate, will have a careers tab on their website with what their job openings are. Uh, because most of these companies are multinational. Um, you can filter if you want to work in Germany, you can see do are there job openings in Germany that might suit you. Um, when we resume normal operations again, um, go to a trade show, go to an industry event. If you're in a city where that company has an office, make yourself known to that company, right? ETC, for example, has locations in all over the world, but in the States, we have four or five offices. I lost track. If you're in Orlando and you think you might wanna work in Madison at some point, make yourself known to the Orlando office. Just drop in, go do training. Always, that's a great suggestion, by the way. It's always a good way for you to meet people in the company is by going to a training that they offer. Um, and then just start networking. But there are tons of opportunities out there that will feed your creative soul and offer you the consistency of a full-time job, which, you know, freelance is hard, guys. It's great. I did it for a long time between gigs. Um, but, you know, there is something to be said for having been able to ride out a pandemic with a full-time job. So something to think about in the future. So, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that helped, but there, there are just tons of things that you might not think about as supply side company needing that your talents might fit into. Cool. Thank you. That was great. Thanks, Ann. I have a question though. Um, I mean, you come from the manufacturing sector. Um, would most of what you're talking about be true, maybe to a lesser degree, on the dealer side? Yeah. Yeah, especially especially the larger dealers, you know, in the in a small market. Um, so I don't know, do people, I don't even know if you guys understand the way products get distributed and sold enough, but I'm gonna just cover it really quickly because I didn't know. Um, it's magic, isn't it? It's magic. So manufacturers make products, right? And people who are doing production need those products. So the path for that is normally, there are, two, there are two paths really. One is through what's called a distribution channel or the dealer network. And that's the guy that you call up to get your gel from or to buy your lamps for your source fours from or whatever, your local dealer. Um, for permanent install work, that's gonna go into an electrical distributor, primarily a, a, on some projects, on other projects, that dealer that you buy your gel from could also package the equipment and sell it directly to a general contractor to be installed. Um, in a small market, the guy who sells you the equipment is probably also gonna be the guy who engineers the system, who troubleshoots the equipment when it goes wrong. In a bigger market, the dealership can afford to have many more people involved. So if you look at a company like a four wall, um, PRG who does systems work or did, I don't know if they still do, um, Christy, you know, they do all hire work, but they still have a big support staff of people who are technical experts. They are logistics people. Um, so yeah, the, the jobs that are available in the dealer network, almost other than the development component of people who design and build the products, um, a lot of those same jobs exist at a dealer level because they're the front lines of support in the market in many cases. So yeah, it's a, that's a great question. Okay, cool. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, well, that's not a surprise. Thank you, Anne. And uh, say, say hi to the boys for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which brings us, did I, I didn't forget anybody, did I? Sarah, are you still with us? I'm still here. Yeah, have yeah, you got anything, anything that you wanna? Well, I don't, I don't think I've, I have a lot to offer because I've worked at the same place for 37 years. So <laughs> <laughs> That's true. The, the only advice I can give is that every job I ever got was because I was willing to scrub buckets. And right. that like holds true of whatever you're going into, whatever the equivalent is, scrub buckets and somebody will hire you. Um, hopefully not to scrub buckets the rest of your life. But <laughs> yeah, the, the key, the key to that idea, I think, is to scrub buckets 
show that you can do other things really well and that you're really not that good at scrubbing buckets. Otherwise, you'll be scr scrubbing buckets the rest of your life. Exactly. Yeah. But the willingness is there. Yeah, the willingness. Uh, yeah and, and flexibility. I mean, a lot of us go into theater work just because we love doing a lot of different kinds of things. And that kind of um, flexibility and creativity is just awesome in the market right now. Everybody needs it, not just the, the theater and production. Right. So, right. Yeah. Right. You know, I think in context, Sarah's comment of being willing to scrub buckets comes down to saying yes. You know, what you want in as someone who runs a lot of has run a lot of crews is you want people who are going to say yes when you ask for something. You know, you don't want to have to explain yourself. You don't want to have to justify why they're being asked to do this. You just want people who say yes. And, you know, when you're the person who says, says yes, you're the person that I'm going to go to all the time. And the more I go to you, the more I'm going to remember you, the more I remember you, the more likely I am to hire you the second time. So that willingness to say yes, I think is really, really important. Yeah, it's a combination of saying yes, but also taking initiative to, to take care of the shit work just because you know it needs to be done. And right. that's somebody that every every crew chief wants. Right. Yeah. It's like, oh, I don't have to worry about the trash getting taken out. It's done. Great. Right. <laughs> Yeah. When, when, when you turn around, you know, and you're, you're, you're pulling your hair out on a bunch of different things that are going on on the project and you look over and somebody is taking care of the trash or sweeping the deck after you know, a lot of carpentry work got done, you know, and you didn't have to ask for that. You're going to score big points for that. Points. Big points. The other thing that, that, that that's heartening for me, uh, several people have mentioned getting that second job. And I actually learned that one from Richard Pilbro. That was, is, remains one of his, his mantras is, you know, get that second job. Getting the first job is usually not that difficult, but getting the second one, you know, that's, that's, that's the kicker. Which I think brings, brings us around to me as the last um, commentator today. Um, and I saved myself for last because I think I've got the, the least glamorous role in all of this, and at least the, 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 there's not a lot uh, on the rigging end, at least not on the installation side, that is uh, terribly sexy. Um, but it's out there, and there are a lot of rigging companies in the marketplace. Um, some of them are almost as good as mine, uh, almost. But, uh, <laughs> but, there's an awful lot going on inside a rigging company, whether or not it's structured like mine, which I mean, all we do is rigging. We're not a lighting or an audio company or any of that. Um, but, um, you know, there are some companies who do that. And there are some companies who do a, um, a lot of uh, uh, other things, audio, um, AV, um, lighting. Um, those jobs are out there. And they're not considered sexy. They're not considered um, glamorous. And um, I think most of us are in a position where we're really looking for people. And that has been true pre-pandemic. Uh, and as we come out of pandemic, he said, knocking on wood, uh, that um, you know, once we come out of it, um, those, pro those jobs are still going to be out there. And, you know, speaking from my experience, as it, it's, it's, it's not hard to get that first job. You, you walk in and present yourself in, in such a way that you make it clear that, you know, you're here to work. If, if, if you have work, if, you, if you're hiring, if you have work, I'm here to do it. And here's my skills. And, you know, let's go to town. Um, the situation is such that, you know, chances are you're going to get that job. Now, as Eddie said earlier, uh, earlier on, you're not going to get the, the high level job right off the bat. You know, you're not going to be the, the, uh, the, the uh, crew chief on an installation for a major performing arts center right off the bat. You're going to be the third grunt from the left. Uh, but third grunts are needed and people pay attention. And when you make everybody else happy that you're there or at least content 
that you're there. You know, you don't necessarily have to make everybody happy, but you know, you don't want to make people unhappy that you're there. Uh, and you're getting the job done that gets you noticed. And over a short period of time, um, you will find yourself moving up the ladder uh, because the ladder has there's missing there are people missing from various uh, skills and positions all along that ladder and you're going to find yourself as long as you know you're you're doing a good job and you're being a nice person being respectful then uh, you'll be uh, you'll you'll find yourself moving up um, and the interesting thing at least from my perspective is that you know as I said earlier everybody's got most people have a, a a vision of a rigging company being, you know, you know, kind of a, a, a grunt kind of a, a project, especially when there's a lot of installation work, permanent installation work going on. But most rigging companies, even the ones who don't necessarily do production or don't advertise that they do production, they do it on occasion. Um, and I, you know, here at Sapsis, we, we, well, we did. <laughs> a fair amount of it and you know we're hoping that that stuff will be coming back and coming back soon but it gives you an opportunity to segue over into the um, the, the more high profile um, maybe what some people would consider the more glamorous projects um, you know we've certainly had our share of glamorous projects they're glamorous to the to the to the outside world um, you know, we did uh, this big job at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City with uh, hanging some uh, sculptures in there. And, you know, it, it went really well, and, and it looked fantastic, and it got a lot of publicity and stuff. And, you know, people were very appreciative of the of the work, you know, the way it looked. The amount of work going into that was, was, was astonishing, and uh, it wasn't nearly as much fun as um, as you would think, you know, especially when you're, trying to stuff 38,000 pounds worth of, of, of artwork into a 130, 140-year-old building. But, um, you know, I, I just, I thought it would be important to let you know that there are these projects, these kind of jobs that are available, and they're available at the local level. When, you know, you don't have to be in Chicago or New York City or, or LA, um, secondary, tertiary markets all have these uh, types of companies, dealers, uh, rigging installers, um, you know, production type companies. And as we move out of the, out of the, um, out of the pandemic, he said, knocking on wood once again, uh, as we move out of that, people are going to be hurting. People are going to be looking for, for, for crew. They're going to be looking for, um, you know, they're going to be looking for warm bodies to begin with, you know, because everybody can just grab a whole bunch of warm bodies and go do a project. But then they're going to start picking out of those warm bodies, the people that really show, you know, stood out. Um, and that's how you, uh, that's how you get the second shot. So that, you know, I mean, that's that, that. That's me, or the the the, the rigging uh, industry, kind of in a in a nutshell. Um, we have time left for questions. Um, there hasn't been a whole lot to begin with, so maybe you guys. Phil. Yes. If if I can, can I add a couple of resources that might be useful to people? Oh yeah. Yeah, please. The two I don't I don't have firsthand experience with these, but uh, I've certainly recently come across them and found that the uh, that they seem to be fulfilling a, a, perhaps a, a a need in the industry. Um, one's a website called NeverFamous.com, uh, and it's a uh, sort of a clearinghouse slash. Let's <laughs> it's effectively LinkedIn for touring professionals. Um, but it's a it's a way for touring professionals to uh, advertise their availability and also for um, production managers to find um, labor, uh, find qualified people. Uh, again, I don't have firsthand experience with it, but um, seemed like an interesting um, 
tool out there in the world. Uh, and there's a program called Diversify the Stage that I've learned a little bit about um, that seems like a, a really important and um, uh, a, 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 a really important uh, uh, idea, a really important uh, action that needs to be taken, uh, and also um, a really uh, effective uh, program that's that's coming into existence. And I urge people to check out both those things and see if they're useful to their particular situation, um, either as a as a person looking for work or as someone who has work that needs uh, doing. That'd be great. Can you put that in? Do you have that available to put in the chat? Uh, yeah, I can. I just, work I just that. put um, a bunch of websites that I had gathered before the, the session today. Um, uh, you know, job boards and that kind of thing. Uh, that I thought might be useful. Um, I'm not familiar with most of them because uh, I don't hire that way. But um, you know, I thought uh, that might and be handy. I, I, so Gabriel, who has his video turned off, just ask a question about being new. Hi, I'm there. Hi. Um, thank you for turning that on. Is looking for tips, like how to start networking if you're new to the industry and. Uh, and I know when I went to my first trade show, I was incredibly intimidated by the idea of walking into a booth and saying, hi, I'm this person and you should like want to talk to me and didn't do that. Um, I would say if you're still in college, like in, you're in America, LDI, I used to, during one of my <laughs> weird career segues, I ran the LDI Institute program for a number of years, which is where you set up all the gear for all the sessions. And that program grew substantially and it is a fantastic way to attend a trade show on someone else's dime and have a reason to be there, right? Because that's always the thing, it's just showing up at a trade show and wandering around hopelessly, hoping to make connections is really hard. So if you are like trying to figure out how to get connected, becoming an, an LDI student, and I, I think it's on their website, I'd have to check like how they advertise it now, of being responsible for setting up the gear in all the conference rooms. It means you talk to designers, you'll call up Richard Pilbro and go, oh, you need this thing, how should this work? Or Bill Clages or whomever. And you go and meet manufacturers because you have to go and pick up equipment from them and all this stuff. So that's a really, really great way to start being exposed to the inner workings of the industry and have a purpose at the same time. I don't, I'm sure other people here have other suggestions as well, but. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. The, the, but these are the, the national trade shows, which aren't necessarily accessible to everybody. Um, depending on where you live and what kind of markets you're, you're, you're near, um, there are local or at least regional um, uh, groups that put stuff together. USITT does stuff regionally well we're assuming i mean we are working in a vacuum at the moment um because we don't really know what's coming back um the other thing that i would suggest is as <laughs> as awful as it might sound but you know the chat rooms the chat groups uh, i'm familiar with the ones on facebook because i'm old and that's what i that's what i deal with um but there's an enormous uh talent base a talent group in there and a lot of people have learned about other people within those chat groups and for the most part it's been my experience uh, in, in particular that for the most part you join a chat group even as as, as a, a an entry level type person um they give you space they give you room to to be an entry level person and to ask questions uh, and and not have it kicked back up in your face. Um, I, I can't say that's true about all of the uh, <clears throat> rigging chat groups. Some of them are are a little bit more obnoxious than others, but we're working on that. Uh, what's Joel got to say here? Uh, Can I throw in something here, Bill? Yeah, Scott. So uh, just a, a recommendation is, is meetings like this, when people are talking about going to somewhere like LDI or USITT, 
you could take a screenshot of this group of people here and you could start asking around on the floor of the events, hey, do you guys know where I could find Bill Sapsis? I was at one of his workshops. Or do you know where I can find so-and-so? And you look at all these names that happen to be on the screen now. And someone will know someone who knows where they are. And you go find them and say, hey, I was part of this workshop that you presented. I had a great time. I learned a lot. Can you point me in the direction of who I should go say hello to? And what booth I should visit? And that sort of thing. And you'll be surprised how many people will literally walk you to somewhere and yeah. introduce you to somebody. Yeah, actually, it's not a surprise, but you're absolutely right. It's a great, great idea. Um, you know, I don't hate it when somebody comes up to me and says, can you help me out? You know, I don't hate that at all because, you know, hey, you know, they're, they're asking me and they, th they think I have, you know, information that, you know, will help them. They soon find right. out that that's not necessarily true, but that's. I mean, I think for all of us, though, you know, this is an industry that does love to help other people because somebody did that for us. You know, my first job that I got after getting out of school was this technical director. I was 22 years old opening this performing arts facility with no professional experience whatsoever. And I later asked the guy whose name is Steve Schulman, I'm still, you know, connected to him. Like, why did he give me the job? Because I know that there were people who were way more qualified than me who applied for that job. And he said, you seem smart. You seem like you were going to work hard and you needed someone to give you a break. And he's like, and at some point, it, you know, you have that you'll do that for someone else. I think all of us had that experience of someone who took a chance on us for the first time. And we do feel it's our obligation to help other people. Yeah. Get established. Yeah, agreed. To speak to, to Joel's comment, yes. Uh, at, at the end of the day, we're a tiny industry. And yes, knowing, you know, people get jobs. Um, because somebody knows somebody, you know, that's, that's, you know, for the, for the most part, it's how I, oh, is that how, it, well, that's how I got my first job. Yeah. You know, um, hang on. Can I say something when you're done? Please, oh, please do. Please do. So I did not get my first job from knowing somebody. I got my first job from being a local and working my ass off. I did somebody's entire front end. Somebody came in on a show that should have had an assistant, didn't have an assistant. Uh, the theater that I was working in uh, didn't have a hired assistant. I was just the next person that he felt comfortable, my head felt comfortable giving me responsibility at the head of the theater. Um, and I did an entire front of house. I did all the patching, I did all this stuff. I took a, a large chunk of work that needed to be done from the he touring head and made it happen. And ask questions in a way that didn't invade him while he was on the radio you know you're, you're like on one radio the other radio goes off and then somebody's yelling at you and now having more experience having experience I understand what that feels like and it's really nice to have somebody that just knows when to ask the question and what questions to ask or comes back and says hey I couldn't get a hold of you so I did this is that okay do you want me to do it differently um basically just showing up and taking weight off of this person's shoulders made it to the point that they were so thankful. They were like, will you please come be my advanced electrician? Will you please come with me to these next two cities? So it wasn't a huge tour. It wasn't a lot of money. Um, it was just somebody who needed help and saw that I was able to provide that help. Uh, I had done that for hundreds of shows before that as a local, because that's what you do. You show up, you do your job and you try to, you know, feel out what people need, whatever. Um, but yeah, I were ended up working for this guy five tours maybe. Um, and it was just that one, had I been in a bad mood that day and not showed up like that, had I written this guy off because, you know, I didn't like him or I didn't have enough coffee that morning, I would have never gotten that job. Um, so you never really know and that is definitely an anomaly um, as opposed to the regular, the norm of knowing somebody and knowing people who know somebody. Uh, I'm sure he did some research on me before he hired, like, well, he didn't. The head carpenter and the production manager from the show he hired me for did research and asked for references. Um, I don't know if, I don't know, usually put references on my resume. I say available upon request uh, because, and I 
because it should it varies depending on who what I'm doing if I'm looking for a film job I use film gaffers if I'm looking for a touring job I use a touring electrician job I use electricians if I'm looking for a prop job I use props like you know um they definitely did research on me uh but yeah that was it wasn't it wasn't because of somebody I knew it was because of the job that I did and the opportunity that I just found myself in where they needed somebody and I was there and already knew how to do the job, the work that they needed that person to do, because I had done it myself. Right. Um, later down the line, things work differently. Um, it is really hard, but definitely what people have been saying about like volunteering or taking interning jobs, um, anything you can do at LDI or USITT or NAM, where you just, even if you just show up and you like help a company run a booth, like you volunteer oh, yeah. for that booth time that gives you access to so many people. Um, and a lot of times I think what it takes is not just being a name on a resume, but being a face that people recognize. And the people that will come to that booth now see that this, the people who run the booth have given you that responsibility, that that, those, that company trusts you to represent them. And that's huge. Um, trust, responsibility, these things, proving that you have these skills to people that are looking for someone they can trust and give responsibility to. Um, so while it sucks to have to give away work for free, it almost always comes back tenfold. That's all. Great. Uh, Joel was asking about intern opportunities and, and you know, uh, especially for uh, people looking to switch into different career paths. Sure. Um, I don't think there's an intern program out there, at least not one that I know about, that has a restriction. You know, I mean, it, you, people bring in interns. I hire interns, by the way. I don't just bring them in. They get paid. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, we're expecting people who have, you know, you know maybe some of the basics, um, but certainly a, a, an interest in whatever, you know, whatever it is that that company is doing. We, we expect them to come in and, and, and be looking to do rigging, not not to come in and do you know, not to be a Verilite operator. So yeah, they do exist. Um, I don't know if there's a, um, a database out there, you know, that's that, um, that you can go to. I'm not, I'm not familiar with it, but. Yeah, I, I don't know. Certainly on the supply side, I don't know of any sort of database like that. And every company runs their internship programs differently, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but as Bill said, I, I've never heard of an internship program that required you to be a college student. And I, you know, and I think that our industry in general is supportive of the idea of people exploring new opportunities and would never tell someone you're too old for this or whatever. Um, well, they might me at this point in time, um, perhaps. Um, HR is usually a good place to start to find, they, they will at least be able to tell you what their internship policies are and who runs their internship programs. Yep. Uh Bill, would it help? I, I don't know if Joel feels like speaking or you got it in the chat, but um, is there any other specifics here? Maybe we could help with slight more direction if you know if you give some idea of what part of the industry you're interested in. Well, I was just wondering because I've seen a lot of the internship requirements are for I've for the job that I've seen have been for people that are in college or about to leave college or in a master's program. And for me, like I've been in, doing lighting and stuff for a while, but as far as wanting to go in a different direction or anything, if those opportunities are actually available to people that aren't in college and don't have to, are not, are not looking for credit or a degree or anything. I would, if, if I would, I would just contact them anyway, whether, forget about what they say, you know, whether it's for college kids or not, you know, you know, if you, if you, if somebody's got a program that interests you, make that known to them and let them know why. I'd be very surprised if somebody would turn down that kind of initiative. Yeah. I, don't, yeah. I, I would say also, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, don't don't over don't um, don't overlook the ability to transition your existing skills into whatever it is that you're you're trying to do without having to go all the way. Bottom's the wrong word exactly, but without having to you know, look for an internship only, right? You know, there's a lot of skills within the lighting discipline that can pretty readily transition into, again, I don't know exactly what it is, but you, you know, whether it's video or automation or, or um, 
any, nearly anything. And on the, certainly any production discipline. Oh, sorry, Jared. Go ahead. Can I just add one certainly more? Certainly add on. Is it, um, if there's a company, like if, um, if there's a company that you're interested in, um, also I think, and Jared sort of alluded to this, take what they have to get into the company sometimes. Like I, I got my, I started my, my career at Very Light by opening Iridian, which I don't know if you guys remember was the architectural division of Very Light because Rusty had this great idea that everyone was gonna want moving lights in all their commercial spaces. Um, I totally didn't want that job at all, but I wanted to work for Very Light. And so I took that job and within a year, they were like, oh, we have this thing we really want to do. And that, that girl over there, she knows how to do that. Um, ETC is famous, famous for stealing people from phone support. Phone support is considered to be an entry level position. It's really, really hard, by the way. You have to have incredible knowledge across a really, really broad portfolio of products. I don't know how they do it. And everybody in the company plucks people out of phone support for jobs elsewhere in the company. And almost every, not, not just ETC, I'm pretty sure that that happens everywhere. Um, so those are always great ways to, if there's a particular company that you're interested in, not sure what job you might want, that's a great way to get in. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, Tom, um... Yeah, there, there, Tom was talking about uh, CITT and USITT. There are other organizations out there. Um, the big ones are USITT, LDI, ESTA. I mean, we haven't mentioned ESTA once today, which is surprising considering who's here. Um, but they all have um, programs or job boards or uh, you know member listings, if nothing else. Uh, and they all give you uh, information to help you um, search out these organizations and these companies. Anything else, folks? Got a couple hands raised, Bill. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, just jump, jump right in. I'm not seeing the hands raised because I wasn't looking at that screen. Jump, jump right in. I, ha I have, I have one for Joel. Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of times, I mean, the biggest part of the deal that we've been talking about is, you know, getting the gig, getting the first phone call, um, and then getting the second gig. There's a lot of people that don't show up for the gig, Joel. So if you know of a gig that's going on and you don't have anything else to do that day, just show up. Somebody else might not show up. And if they say all of a sudden, God, we're, we're down a guy, who do we got? Hey, just raise your hand. You know, there have been a lot of gigs that somebody's been sitting on the dock, sitting there having a smoke, waiting for something to do. Um, there are a lot of people that don't show up. And that's what I say. You know, the hardest part of the job is having the people show up. You know, like was mentioned earlier, 50 percent of the people didn't show up for the gig. If you're standing by doing nothing, they will take you. And then all you've got to do is prove yourself for the day. You know, and if, if you were worthy, if you did what they needed done and you laughed and joked and, you know, you're on the next gig, you've got the second gig. It's, it's you know, kind of crazy, kind of that easy sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and bring donuts. Yeah, tacos, donuts, burritos. <laughs> <laughs> bring your tools. Well, yeah. Bring we, your we, had, we actually had a guy at our local who wanted to come to work for us. And he asked if it was okay if he used the computer in the lobby and just hang out in case there was an opening. And, you know, there was no problem. So we let him do it. And I swear to God, within the first week, he got his first job. And then he would come back in show clothes with his tools and play on that computer because every single day there was somebody who didn't show up. And you go, hey, Michael, you want to work today? <laughs> Boom, he was there. So it's, you know, being the squeaky wheel, being in, in, you know, what is it, luck, combination of skill and opportunity, right? Right. So you, being, putting yourself in that position to take advantage of the opportunity is what you're talking about, Stuart, and it's really true. Um, check. <laughs> there are some places that they don't welcome people to just hang out and wait and see if somebody doesn't show up. So you want to make sure you're not breaking any rules when you do that, you know. 
local local autonomy, local rules have different uh, nuances to them. So it's not a bad idea to ask, hey, can I hang out here just in case somebody doesn't show up? And, oh, yeah, sure, fine. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you got to make yourself known, yeah. right? You know. Otherwise, you know, they're going to call the cops on you because, you know, <laughs> that, cause that's what they do these days. Vagrant? Yeah. Yeah. Stagehand, vagrant, stagehand, vagrant. Yeah. Yeah, you know the difference. That game in San Francisco. Right. <laughs> the difference between a vagrant and a stagehand is the stagehand has a schedule. <laughs> nice. Um, um, one other thing I would say that a lot of people don't always think of once you've been working for a while, it's harder to like think about this, but shop work. Um, in whatever industry you're looking for, get a job in a shop. Even if you're sweeping the floor, you will work. You will work your way up, and you will learn skills that you can take with you everywhere. You might not be a rigger, but I tell you what, knowing how to fix a chain motor when you are in China is real helpful because, you know, you'll meet people, you might get paid minimum wage, but you might also work your way up or find that you really like doing a certain kind of machinery or a certain kind of God only knows what. Um, it doesn't always pay great, but it's definitely worth the time that you put in and Working in shops for me was huge when I started doing production work, uh, understanding how to take lights apart completely to clean them, how to understand, you know, how how to re-solder cable was a huge thing that I learned in a shop that a lot of people don't actually get practical experience with. That's very helpful on tour. Very helpful. You would be surprised how much you end up doing things. Um, but yeah, shop work is something else I throw out there. Even as an intern, that kind of thing too, uh, just putting yourself in that environment of where you want to be. And if you don't like it, you don't have to stay, but at least you tried and you never know when somebody that you used to work with all of a sudden starts their own moving light company or scenic company. And all of a sudden you see them at a conference and they're like, oh my God, how are you? And they're like, want to come work with me? So you never know where opportunities will take you. Cool. Thank you. I think one of the things to keep in mind that this industry rewards people for the most part, rewards people who are willing to, to, to show up on time, to put a smile on their face, do their job, ask the right questions, you know, and not, but not be, you know, a complete nudge about it and, and do what they're told. And this might vary based on size of market, but some of them, I, I'm really lucky that I have a lot of um, younger friends. Um, they help keep me somewhat young, I think. One of the trends that I'm seeing amongst that group of people who are starting, trying to start their careers is, and this is going to depend on the size of the market that you're in, but like specific to New York, um, and this has happened in Los Angeles as well, find out who the up and comers in that market are and like, where do they drink? and go to the bar and meet them. And because like one of the ways people have started getting work, work my, most of my connections are with the Broadway programming community. Um, like make yourself known to those people and they're gonna recommend you maybe once they know you to sub on a show for them. And then that's, you know, you sub on that show that gets you another job here, but it's all local community. It's not through production management it's through local recommendations of friends that are your peers in whatever market you happen to be in. It can also be a really effective way, not only of knowing what's happening in that market, but of getting work sometimes. And they and now what's really interesting about it is they support each other. If a call comes in for a show and they can't take the show, here are my friends that are available for that show, you know? Um, and there's th that level of networking when I was that age didn't exist and it does now. And I think it's awesome. All right, well, thank you, Anne. And thank you all. I think if we, we end this session on, on a note about drinking, I think it's probably appropriate. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, um, thank you all uh for 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 joining us today uh, i hope it was helpful uh, speaking for myself i'm certainly available uh at, at other times i think the others will will agree that uh 
we're available if you have other questions or you know you know if you're looking for work uh, you want to check in with us we may know somebody uh, well, yeah, we, we know a couple of people between us I think we know a couple of people um, this this session will be uh, uh, put up on Friday on the uh, the YouTube channel uh, which you can uh, get to through uh, the sapsis rigging page the same one that you uh, registered for this session and uh, there will be a couple more uncle bill seminars coming up in the in the near future I'm, it'll be a week or two because uh, we're busy and i have other things that i need to do but there are a couple of other ideas that uh, we're going to explore if you have ideas for a, a seminar you'd like us to do uh, let us know we'd be uh, be happy to uh, to entertain a notion to do that. Um, we stopped doing them for a little bit, and, and I don't, speaking for myself, I discovered that I missed it, and uh, you know, I'd like to uh, uh, continue doing it. All right, so thank you all very much. Have a safe and a good uh, rest of your, your day. Uh, Jared, go back to sleep. Uh, <laughs> and... Um, Take care of yourselves and, uh, you know, be kind out there. Thanks, right. Bill. Thanks, Bill. Thank you all. See you all out in the world. See yeah. you all later.